I don't like being treated like an animal, and I don't like, like people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. I'm perfectly happy with the person I am and I've always been. Chilling words from Ted Bundy, one of history's most notorious serial killers. Welcome to Crime and Psychiatry. Today, we'll peel back the layers of Bundy's mind as revealed in a 1977 interview. At this time, he had not yet been convicted of any murders, was acting as his own lawyer, and maintained his complete innocence of all charges. So, without further ado, let's dive into the darkness of a depraved mind. Bundy spends his life inside this 16-cell county jail. He gets up at 6.30 in the morning, walks, he says, about two miles a day, pacing a cell. But he spends most of his time preparing his defense. Bundy refused to discuss any of the specific charges or allegations against him. He says he doesn't think about being convicted or executed. He thinks about being exonerated. His first-degree murder trial will most likely begin next fall. This is cutting up. And you were that wear jeans and uh, blue shirts. Yes, sir. Is your family back to see you? Uh, not as yet. It's a rather expensive trip. Yeah. Uh, Aspen's that's the place to stay. Your mom's still up in Washington? Yeah. We'll start. Pardon me. Here. We plan to have her die. Plan to have her die. To most people, this initial part of the interview may seem very insignificant, but I think it is important because it shows Bundy trying to appear nonchalant, relatable, and benign. He avoids talking about the regime of the other prison or his current confinement. Instead, he talks about clothing when asked about what life was like in the previous prison and references the cost of his family coming to visit. These are far more relatable issues for most than the details of prison regime and confinement and serve to anchor the discussion in relatable concerns rather than in issues which would cause viewers to reflect on what crimes he was charged with. It is subtle, but I see this sort of behavior all the time in psychopaths. They try to manage conversations to always present the facade they wish to project versus the reality of what lies underneath. I understand that some may question drawing such a conclusion from such a small sample of the interview, but honestly, once you've interviewed a few hundred psychopaths, you start seeing these patterns of behavior run through almost every aspect of every conversation. It is just the way they are wired 24-7. 365. First of all, I guess I should just ask, how are you doing out here? Yes, sir. So, short question, is there in the long answer? Uh, I'm doing well, I feel good. Uh, working hard on my case. Uh, need a lot more sun and a lot more fresh air, but other than that, I'm doing okay. Do you? Get fresh air, son? Do you get out? Well, I get to go to the library. <laughs> it's a 50-yard walk from here across this, across the parking lot to the library. That's my fresh air. Again, there's a strategically composed amount of eye contact, smiling and change in body posture and orientation to be far more welcoming and focused on the interviewer once the interview started. Again, he doesn't want to focus on the details of his imprisonment and chooses to focus on his work on creating his legal defense and the fact that he needs more fresh air. Again, something more relatable to most than complaints about the strictures of the prison regime. Do you have more freedom in Utah State Prison? <laughs> well, uh, when I was in, on the main line, as they say, in medium security, I had a lot more freedom, you bet. A big yard to walk in and a basketball court and handball court, you know, yeah. Your standard medium security life in a prison is, is a fairly decent existence, relatively speaking, to a county jail. County jails are, by and large, pretty confined and uh, inhibiting sort of places. Why did you decide to defend yourself? I began thinking about that way back in Utah. Uh, I had a year to study criminal law in action and I have a lot of strong, I have a, I'm a very biased person. I have a lot of strong opinions about how things should be done. And when I came here, I think that my opinions were established to the point where the method that my attorneys wished to impose here and my own did not agree, and we couldn't coexist. 
and theirs were right for them, and it might have been to be right for me. I find the use of the word impose interesting. It appears Bundy didn't like the advice his lawyers gave him, and so chose to forge his own path. That could be eminently reasonable if they were giving him bad advice, or it could be a quite grandiose decision. Given how poorly Bundy did in law school, this decision is, in my opinion, more grandiose than reasonable, but it certainly would feed into the psychopath's need for control and distrust of others, in this case, his lawyers. I am very, I have the greatest amount of confidence that, at least in the preparation stage, that my ideas will work. And believe me, I'm not standing here alone. I'm just cold to have it as an attorney friend of mine today. Every day I get input, every day I ask questions. Uh, but the reason I went on my own is because I just felt it was time. I felt it was right. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to become a part of my defense because I am such a part of it. I mean, I, I, obviously, I'm going to bear the consequences, so why not bear the responsibility of, uh, of seeking my own acquittal and uh, sustaining my own innocence? Ted, when you left, so... He portrays his decision to take an active role in his defense as a rational choice driven by personal conviction and the desire for involvement. However, this approach is quite characteristic of individuals with narcissistic and psychopathic traits who often believe they are the most capable and best suited to handle matters concerning themselves and distrust others. Lastly, there's another check glance at the camera to assess reaction. Personally, I find that glance quite chilling. There's no hint of the affable open man who expects to be found innocent because he is innocent in that glance. Obviously, you can't convict a man on a glance, but knowing what we know now, I can't help but reflect on that sort of glance being the last thing many of his victims saw. Ted, when you left Salt Lake, when you were extradited, you issued a statement saying, you feel that everything will turn out all right, that you are innocent. Do you still feel that? Mm, yeah, yeah, more than ever. Uh, of course, uh, you can't help but become an advocate for yourself when you're so involved in the case. And being a good defense attorney, and I'm not, again, I'm not pretending I'm an attorney, but, but being, putting yourself in a position of being your own counsel, it's that positive psychology. You've got to do it. You've got to do it because you're right. You've got to do it because the person you're representing is innocent. It just happens to be, in this case, I've got a lot of stake, and the person I'm representing is myself, and I'm working all the harder. Yeah, I feel good about it, and yes, I feel that I'm right, and yes, I feel I'm going to make it, no doubt in my mind. We now know Bundy was guilty as hell. So is this either self-delusion or a strategic attempt to reshape public opinion? Well, I think Bundy was being very honest when he said, I'm perfectly happy with the person I am and I've always been. And therefore, my conclusion is that he knows precisely what he is and isn't self-deluding at all. Again, he is shaping the public narrative. We need to remember that Bundy had an undergraduate education in psychology and clearly remembered some of it, as his reference to positive psychology shows. There's always one thing that amazed me, as you know, I covered you in trial, and I was there every day. When you, uh, when the judge found you guilty of uh, second degree kidnapping, you never showed any emotion. Do you? For somebody who believes he is so innocent, why was there no emotion? My attorney, John, o John O'Connell in Salt Lake, and I've always mused over just how I should behave. What's the right way for Ted Bunny to behave and make sure that people get the right impression? And I just behave the way I feel is right. Okay, let me take the day of March 1st, 1st 1976, the day that the judge rendered his verdict in my case first. I didn't show any emotion because, you know, what am I supposed to do? Am I going to jump up on the table? Am I going to scream? That's what I felt like doing. I heard my mother cry. Uh, <laughs> it's an emotional time. I don't even like to think of that day. But I wasn't going to give these people who went out and built a case around a non-existent eyewitness, uh, an, an eyewitness identification that was built by the police. I wasn't going to give them satisfaction seeing me break down. To be fair to Bundy, this is actually quite reasonable for a certain type of person and type of thinking. The problem for Bundy is that the sort of person who cares enough to curate their public image, even at such times, tends to be someone who cares about their public perception, has a strong desire for control, and not appearing weak. 
and is able to emotionally detach themselves from what would be very distressing situations for most people. Again, not enough to prove anything on its own and not enough to label him a psychopath or killer on its own, but it is helping us build a picture of what matters to this man and what he is capable during stressful times. So far, even by playing the role he is clearly playing during this interview, he has shown us he cares about how he is perceived. Specifically, he doesn't wish to appear weak. Control is very important to him and he dislikes when others have it over him. He is able to emotionally detach in stressful situations and is able to appear superficially charming for short periods of time. And uh, sure I'm mad, I'm showing emotion right now because inside I'm mad. Uh, but I've kept it together because there's no point in destroying myself. I have got to keep myself together, I have got to stay calm, I have got to keep my presence of mind because as long as I do that, I'm going to be to the people. And that's the way I feel. Uh, I showed no emotion. I felt emotion. Believe me. Uh, I showed no emotion. I felt emotion. Believe me. Yeah, he'd like that. He'd like for us to believe him. His narrative is that he isn't a psychopath. He's just very controlled because, as a victim here, he isn't going to give those persecuting him the satisfaction of seeing him break. Quite a lot of people would be able to identify with that sort of thing. As to there being... No point in destroying myself. You can choose to view this either as the resolve of an innocent man to win out and be vindicated, or as the rationalization of the narcissistic psychopath. Given Bundy's history, I think it is the latter. I've treated many patients like this. I remember once treating a patient who had made a show of causing harm to come to himself, high YouTube word censor, when accused of crimes against minors. Over time, it became absolutely clear that he did this in order to get hospitalized as part of a plan to avoid trial by getting a doctor's letter that he shouldn't stand trial. So far, so malevolent and devious. The reason I bring this patient up is that even when trying to convince us that he intended to self-terminate, if released, he couldn't bring himself to a state that the motivation would be because of the harm he caused. Instead, he portrayed himself as the victim of a grand conspiracy to ruin his and his family's good name, and that he would self-terminate to avoid prison and publicity, and B.B. B. come up with any plan for self-termination, which didn't show tremendous narcissism. His most detailed plan was to buy local anesthetic online, so that any attempt at self-termination wouldn't be painful and to ensure that he didn't cause any trauma to his facial region because he didn't want his mother to be unable to see his beautiful face in an open casket. He actually referred to his own face as my beautiful face. I had another narcissist who wanted to jump into the ocean as his preferred method but decided against it. Again, the reason he gave was that he wanted his beautiful face to be viewable during the funeral. It sounds comical, but it exhibits just how fundamentally they are unaware of how ridiculous some of what they say can sound, and how they often cannot prevent themselves saying such things, even when it is very harmful to their case. Now, <laughs> the irony comes here. When Carol DeRoch, the kidnapping victim from Utah, came to testify in this preliminary hearing here, I was beside myself with rage. Uh, she is turning into a professional witness as far as I'm concerned. She is a prosecution witness. And when I heard her go through that routine that I had heard three times before, I had restrained myself every time. I couldn't do it this time. And I told my attorney, I said, I'm going to get up. And I got up and I pointed at the judge and I pointed at her and I said, she's lying. She's lied three times before and she's lying now. And I helped it. And he pulled me down and he says, listen, he says, you can't do that. And I said, okay, but I had to do it for once. For once, they had to do it. And do you know something? People say, Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. There must be something in that. I showed emotion. You know what people said? See, he really can't get violent and angry. Uh, there's no right, right way for me to act. Well, I think people would have given Ted a lot more leeway if he hadn't been a serial killer. Just listen to the poor serial killer bemoaning how society is so unfair to him. I think that however Bundy tries to spin it, the problem with his outburst in court wasn't that he showed emotional range. It was that it showed that his emotions could overrule his conscious mind even when it was deeply problematic for them to do so. It wasn't that he showed any emotion. 
it was that it probably made a lot of people ask themselves whether that Ted Bundy was the last thing many women saw. And that's a really bad question to put in people's minds because many will answer yes. Again, though, we see his keen awareness of the importance of public perception, his understanding of the harm he did to his cause with his outburst, and his attempt to manage the narrative with what he says during the interview. There is a strong undercurrent of victimization and being just a regular guy who is being wronged by others. It is that pattern of lack of control and responsibility, blame shifting, attempting to redraft the narrative and glib cunning that we've seen repeatedly throughout the interview. I act, and I don't care what people think about how I act. I act according to the way I think is right and best for me at the time. And I'm not going to try to please people or impress people because, quite frankly, the amount of bias and, and prejudice that surrounds me as a, as a media image, I can't begin to tear down. Not with this interview or a hundred interviews. Well, he is just flat out lying here. His previous references to his public image during this interview show that he cares what people think about how he acts. One trick I often use when interviewing psychopaths is that when we get to the portion of the assessment which deals with their motivations, I just reverse everything they say. If they say they care about X, then they don't. If they say they don't care about Y, then they do. It isn't a complex strategy, but very frequently I think you get much closer to their inner truths by reversing what they say than by accepting it at face value. Obvious caveats that this isn't simply a 100% perfect, simple trick to understand psychopaths that some channels seem to think exists. It's just a useful trick when trying to ferret out what their true motivations are. Ted, do you believe I'm a person from the media, the other people here, do you believe that we created you, that, 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 it is, that it's our fault, that we created this image of, of the man's murder? Is, is that what you're saying to us? Um, well, I think in the course of doing your job, you did. Not, at a, not in a malign way, not, not, not in a, a personal vendetta against me, but in the course of, of, of publishing the uh, material uh, and broadcast the material coming out of the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office or the Salt Lake County Prosecutor's Office, you began to plant the seed in people's minds. Now, that may be your constitutional right and duty as well as, you know, your livelihood. Uh, but I think in the process, you did create a media image of me uh, that's far beyond, you know, the reality of me. By implying that the media image is far removed from his real self, he's trying to create a distinction between Ted Bundy, the person, and the Bundy monster, a being manufactured by media sensationalism. He's very understandably trying to create clean air between himself and this Bundy monster. The problem, of course, is that since he actually was a monster, fighting this narrative is quite difficult for him. Was John O'Connell called the Bundy Monster? That's what he called it. We ought to show him. I suggested that to John, we ought to get Mattel to make little dolls that walk and say, I am the Bundy Monster. That's just a bizarre image to raise. I get that he's trying to be humorous, but it just seems very detached and different than I would expect a normal person to respond in a similar situation. Also, there's a lovely little check glance towards the camera at the end of his statement. Again, looking to measure how his little joke was received. This reminds me a little of Ed Kemper's story about the pen being mightier than the sword, in terms of giving the same air of being a very practiced line Bundy came up with to deal with precisely this line of questioning. Uh, Ted, let me ask you this. You totally believe you're innocent. Uh, um, I'm not questioning that. My question to you is, how did it come to be that Ted Bundy uh, could be involved in some of these things. There has now been charged conviction, conviction warrants. Uh, we have facing first degree murder charges. Uh, and as you know, was being suspected in, in other murders. How did Ted Bundy come out? Where did it come from? That's a very long story, and I could really can't. If I knew the answers to that question, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I'd be back in Salt Lake with a new trial. And one day I'll have those new, uh, one day I'll have those answers, and one day I'll have a new trial. Okay? But I don't know why. Okay? I, I can't begin to understand why. I know that, that there's a lot of uh, police ego on the line. I know that a lot of men in the detectives division in Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office jobs are on the line. 
I know that it's, it's a long time ago, it ceased to be an issue as to whether or not I was innocent or guilty. The issue is now is can we pin it on it? Can we, can we follow through and, and, and maintain our rep reputation as law enforcement officers? And I'll tell you, as long as they attempt to keep their heads in the sand about me, there's going to be people turning up in canyons and there's going to be people being shot in Salt Lake City because the police there aren't willing to accept what I think they know, and they know that I didn't do these things. Ah, the grand conspiracy against the wronged man, and the fact that he isn't going to be alone in suffering, but that the focus of his persecutors on him is going to allow real killers to keep on killing. In other words, this is harming society too. He isn't being selfish in protesting his innocence. He's also trying to save lives that police are sacrificing. The odious victimhood of the narcissistic psychopath comes off Bundy in waves here. It's all so very predictable and par for the course of your first hundred or so interviews with psychopaths. It is ironic to hear him talk like this because in the end, he confessed to 30 murders and was suspected in a few more. In reality, I suspect that he murdered over 100, including a large number of non-adults. Anyway. Okay, then how do you exist every day? How do you keep your sand? Well, uh... <laughs> well, are you keeping your sand? You're, you're a young man, you're yeah. intelligent, obvious. obviously. How, how do you say in a little cell and mm -hmm. say sand? Ooh, he liked being called a young, intelligent man. There is even a quick little check glance at the cameraman. This interviewer knows how to use flattery to keep Bundy talking. I think she had a much better sense of whom she was dealing with than Dobson would have over a decade later. They gave me a, a year's training course in that, uh, from March 1st to 76 until I was uh, extradited to Colorado. I was locked up. I had a lot of time to work on being locked up. Uh, it wasn't easy at first, but now it's easy. I mean, they made me hard inside, and I can spend time in there. I don't like it. I'll never like it. I'll never accept it. But I can deal with it because I know how to, I had to, let's say. Have you trained your mind? Train the mind. Is that yeah, that's the word I was going to use? It's not exactly training your mind. It's just creating your own environment in here. Okay. And not looking at the ceiling and not looking at the wall and not thinking about the outside and not anguishing over the fact that you've lost your freedom. But simply in here, simply knowing some free because. I'm I live for it for hours a day in that basement for the library. Nothing really too surprising or incriminating here, except that his self-confessed ability to compartmentalize and detach from the external environment is often seen in individuals who have a high need for control. Interestingly, it may also be indicative of dissociative tendencies used as a coping mechanism. It is probably part of the reason why Dr. Dorothy Lewis felt Ted Bundy may well have suffered from dissociative identity disorder and why she felt he wasn't competent to stand trial at this time. I should say that I strongly disagree with Dr. Lewis's conclusion here and agree with Dr. Dietz that Dr. Lewis and her compatriots incorrectly diagnosed a lot of people, including a number of serial killers, with dissociative identity disorder. What did you say? It's in quite well. This is my favorite part of the entire interview. This is a law enforcement officer who is clearly wearing a facial expression of been there, done that, heard it all, and sick of this shit. Whoever he is, I like it. For 12, six and a half, I felt, and if somebody talks to me, they're, they're locked up, they're punished here. You know, you're told, you be not tough to better. I don't know why. I don't know why this is apparent. Well, this is just disingenuous. Obviously, they're paranoid because they've got a suspected serial killer who is manipulative, will probably try to manipulate the other prisoners, and has a history of escaping from prison. I'd be pretty damned paranoid too if I was running that prison and would have put a lot of restrictions on Bundy. Bundy clearly isn't as smart as he thinks he is, but he is smart enough to understand that. How does this compare to there, to the Utah State Prison? <laughs> it's a good deal smaller. Uh, I can't, I couldn't give you any exact figures, but I suppose if I was in medium security and at uh, Utah State Prison, you'd have several acres to roam around in, all the, 
all the blocks, uh, the gymnasium, uh, industries area and whatnot. Even in maximum security, we got to go outside, go to the weight room. What time do you get up? 6.30. Exercise? I walk uh, about two miles a day. Inside? 800 mini laps. <laughs> I haven't been following your case that closely, but you'll have to agree you're the target of a great deal of mystery. And you said earlier macabre interest. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, you'll have to admit there's, a, there's a, a hell of a lot of circumstantial evidence, at least circumstantial. It seems to somebody who has read or simply read newspapers and articles. No, I won't admit that. <laughs> no, there's, uh, I, I don't call it, it's not circumstantial as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't really know exactly what you're referring to, and I don't really want to discuss it. But uh, it, I don't care what they, anybody says or, or the, uh, the suspicions anyone harbors on the basis of that misinformation. And indeed, that's what I call it, circumstantial uh, information perhaps, but misinformation as far as I'm concerned. Uh, a lot of people trying to pin a lot of stuff on somebody because, uh, you know, it's convenient. But... Uh, you think you've done shut up? Well, I don't think there's any broad scheme, uh, but I think one begins to... I would have to infer that uh, based on some of the police activity. I think following November of 75, you'd have to say that there was a general uh, design amongst police officers in several jurisdictions to, to do whatever they could. And I think a statement recently made by a, a sheriff in Utah, um, Utah County, I believe, he said that he walked out in some of those meetings because it was just clear that they were just, they had one thing on their mind and they were going to do anything to prove it. And I think this trial will show exactly what they've done. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say people have perjured themselves, but I think that'll come out. Are you angry? Sure, I get angry, uh, get very, very angry and indignant. Uh, I don't like being locked up for something I didn't do, and I don't like my liberty taken away, and I don't like being treated like an animal, and I don't like, like people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm perfectly happy with the person I am, and I've always been. There's not, not a, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I don't pay my telephone bills on time, and I don't write my mother, uh, as many letters as I should, there are all kinds of things I can prove about myself, but a weirdo knows I, I feel good about myself. I'm happy with myself. You don't change. You stay Ted Bundy 24 hours a day. <laughs> well, uh, gee, that name sounds funny. You know, I hear Ted Bundy in so many different contexts. I stay me, okay? I, I, I've matured in the past year. Believe me, I've grown in the past year. And I've learned a lot of things about myself in the past year. Being in prison, going through a kind of hell, mature as a person. And I, and I think it's, it's done good things for me. Uh, my only misgivings is that I might never be, might never be in a position to apply it, you know, on the streets where I'd like to apply it. In this segment, Bundy vehemently refuses to acknowledge the weight of circumstantial evidence against him, portraying it as misinformation. His dismissal of the evidence as merely convenient pinning by the authorities and the media could be seen as an attempt to undermine the credibility of the case against him and position himself as a victim of a broader conspiracy. Bundy's refusal to admit any validity to the evidence suggests a deep commitment to the narrative of his innocence or a psychological defense mechanism to protect his self-image from the reality of his actions. Bundy's emotional response, marked by anger and indignation, is particularly notable. He expresses a visceral reaction to the way he's perceived and treated, vehemently denying any similarity to the monstrous persona created by the media. This strong emotional response could be indicative of narcissistic injury, where his grandiose self-image is threatened by external perceptions and accusations. Furthermore, Bundy's assertion of self-happiness and growth while in prison indicates an attempt to portray personal development and resilience. He contrasts the perceived image of a weirdo with his own self-assessment as a normal individual with everyday shortcomings, possibly aiming to elicit empathy and dissociate from the monstrous image.
His mention of personal growth and maturation while incarcerated can be seen as a strategic move to humanize himself and suggest a potential for rehabilitation, which might be particularly aimed at influencing legal outcomes or public perception. Lastly, Bundy's reflection on the possibility of never being able to apply his purported personal growth on the streets introduces a note of regret or lost potential. This sentiment could be genuine or another calculated move to evoke sympathy and further distance himself from the dehumanized image portrayed in the media and the court of public opinion. Do you ever think when you're in that cell mm -hmm. about the possibility that you could one day face a firing squad? They don't have firing squads in Colorado and I don't think that in any event other than I, I ever think, I don't think about it, honest to God. And, I, and I've been asked that question before, and I'm gonna give you a pat answer if you don't mind. When you, did you fly over here from Utah? Yes. Did it worry you all the way over that you might be killed in a car, in a, you know, a plane crash? No. Did you think, are you thinking about it now, going back? Same here. I think I stand about as much chance of dying in front of a firing squad or in a gas chamber as you do being killed on a plane flight home. Let's hope you don't. <laughs> I just love the psychopathic detachment shown by his correction of the journalist about firing squads in Colorado. Try to imagine asking any relatively normal person this question and, and them, focusing on an inaccuracy in the method mentioned, as opposed to the general thrust of whether or not they think about dying. You'd think they were a pretty unusual type, wouldn't you? Also, Bundy's likening of the possibility of being sentenced to death to the possibility of being in a plane crash is illuminating. Being sentenced to death as punishment for crimes committed really has very little practically or philosophically in common with just being in the wrong place at the wrong time when something goes wrong with an airplane. I suspect that this example fits Bundy's narrative of just being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being chosen to be a patsy by incompetent police. Also, most of the time with plane crashes, no one thinks the passengers bear any responsibility for the crash and their deaths. I suspect that wasn't lost on Bundy when choosing this simile. Not only was he in the wrong place at the wrong time to be persecuted by corrupt cops, but no one should think he bears any responsibility for anything that happened to him. I find Dahmer by far the most sympathetic of the serial killers whose interviews I've analyzed so far. Kemper is interesting because he's clearly far more intelligent than the interviewer and dominates the entire interview. He attempts charm and a bonominous raconteurishness, which he can't quite carry off because of his schizotypal personality disorder. Aline Warnos is particularly interesting for the barely restrained anger and hatred she exhibits. Bundy isn't as smart as Kemper by a long stretch, but he is far more socially capable and charming, and his interviews are great examples of a psychopath using glib, superficial charm to manipulate the narrative. He isn't as smart as Kemper, but you can totally see how he is so much more socially malleable and how this allowed him to camouflage himself in order to get into situations where he could kill. But so you don't lie awake at night thinking about it? Not a moment. Honest to God, not a moment. Because it's not going to happen. And, uh, in the, you know... Overall, Bundy's response to the possibility of execution underscores his consistent narrative of detachment, self-assurance, and refusal to engage with the consequences of his actions. In isolation, this detachment could be intrinsic to his personality, a product of his narcissistic traits, or a necessary psychological adaptation to cope with the stress and reality of his situation. Some have argued that this might be evidence of death row syndrome, but looking at the interview and the timeline, I'd argue that Bundy wasn't suffering from death row syndrome at this time as a he hadn't been in prison or death row long enough to develop it, and b. He doesn't appear to be suffering from any of the mood or psychotic symptoms which often accompany it. Are you going to be a free man? man? You, I mean, you think that about being a free man? Sure. Yeah. And you think what I say there is circumstantial evidence that, that I'm in left field, there isn't circumstantial evidence. I know there isn't. You're dealing on the outside, I'm on the inside. Okay. I mean, you, you have access to information, but I'm on the inside. Uh, I know what's there and I know what isn't there. I've seen the files and I've heard the reports. Uh, and Lord knows, I'm the first and foremost person who has the personal intimate knowledge that it couldn't be me, that it's not me, that I'm innocent. Okay. 
feeling from that on out, I know exactly what's what. You know, and uh, when you tell me the circumstantial evidence, I'm not going to argue with you, uh, Lucky. It's just so let's just wait and let's just let it come out in court. And let's let it be examined in open court, and I'll lay my money on me. And that's the way I feel. You think about getting out of here? Well, <laughs> well, uh, legally, sure. Interestingly, his certain knowledge that he didn't commit the crimes was only the third reason he remembered for justifying his innocence. Again, you can't hang a conviction on a single fact. But if I were wrongly accused of murder, the number one reason I'd always give for knowing I was wrongly accused would be that I'd know I hadn't done it. That'd be top of my list long before it came to arguing the details of files and reports. His distinction between being on the outside versus on the inside is a fascinating one. Bundy implies that his intimate knowledge of the situation, the evidence and himself as a person, gives him a unique insight that those on the outside cannot comprehend. This is a manipulative tactic to sow doubt about the evidence in the prosecution's case by suggesting that he has a privileged understanding of the truth not accessible to the interviewer or us, the viewers. As such, we should believe what he says more than what we think because he knows things we don't. That's his narrative in any case. I actually laughed the first time I watched this and hear Bundy give the qualifier that he'd like to get out legally. Yeah, nothing makes you look more guilty than staging a prison break. Or three. <laughs> With the rumors that have gone on about you, and you're more aware of them than I am, how have you been treated in prison by other inmates? Well, I think you may made your life more difficult or, or dangerous being in prison. I think you may be more aware of the rumors than I am. For this reason, I have heard a lot of talk and there might be an inmate X who says you know Bundy's this and that kind of person but you know when I'm confronted person to person by these people or by people in general I have never I have never been accused I have never been assaulted I have never been verbally abused and the reason is because I hold my head high I have fully I believe in myself and I treat every man with the respect that he deserves and that's the way you get along in prison. One of the many ways you get along in the joint is that you treat a man with respect, that you don't try to, to, uh, to hustle somebody, uh, that you come across straight to them. One of the first things you learn that if you're a straight con and you keep your mouth shut and, and, and you keep tight with good people, you're going to stay out of trouble. That's just, and, yet, and it doesn't make any difference what you've done. In this segment, Bundy discusses his prison experience, asserting immunity from assault or verbal abuse due to his conduct and respect towards others, which he credits for his unharmed state in the harsh prison hierarchy. He implies that maintaining a strong, respectful demeanor is key to his survival and status among inmates. This claim is part of Bundy's self-fashioned image of control and dignity, aligning with his characteristic self-assurance. His advice on being a straight con and his insights into prison social dynamics indicate a deep understanding of the prison culture and the need for respect and strategic alliances. Bundy's depiction serves to reinforce his self-image, mitigate the impact of his notoriety and present himself as a competent individual adept at navigating complex social systems, though the accuracy of this portrayal is questionable. I think it would be worth asking whether or not how the other inmates react to him might have less to do with his explanation and more to do with them recognizing that he was likely a serial killer and thus extremely dangerous. What happens if you're in prison five years and nothing like what has happened in the past happens again? What do you mean? I mean, any, any of the things that you have been accused of by innuendo, by rumor, by the police departments or whatever, what if there are no killings or no kidnappings. It's already happened, hasn't it? I've heard some reports, I, you know, I, I remember the, the incidents between, the, between five and eight, which are similar to the ones which the, the police have had the, the nerve to try to associate with me. It's going to continue to happen in Salt Lake and Utah until those police start to wise up and, and stop, stop, stop counting their chickens before they hatch. I think it's a terribly dangerous mentality to try to pin something on somebody who, 
who they might, who they believe so there's a possibility it couldn't have done it. And as long as they believe that, they're not going to find the right man. And the man who kidnapped Carol Durange is going to continue to be free. And not only her, but every other young woman in the Salt Lake Valley is going to, is going to be threatened by that person or persons. And it's happening today, and it's going to happen in the future. In this segment, Bundy suggests that ongoing crimes similar to those he's accused of while he is in prison indicate his innocence, employing projection to deflect blame onto law enforcement or another perpetrator. He uses reports of such incidents to seed doubt about his guilt and criticize the police for prematurely blaming him, aiming to portray himself as a victim of a flawed justice system and discredit the investigation. This not only serves to discredit the police investigation, but also portrays Bundy as a victim of a flawed justice system, potentially eliciting sympathy or support from those skeptical of law enforcement. This tactic not only attempts to elicit sympathy, but also shifts focus from his charges to broader public safety concerns, insinuating that the real criminal remains free. This deflection serves multiple purposes. It positions him as concerned about community safety, undermines the police's credibility, implicitly asserts his innocence, and posits that continuing to persecute him diverts police focus and puts society at more risk. Lastly, by trying to undermine Carol Durant, one of the few survivors who could positively identify him, he's attempting to cast doubt on her testimony and the police's reliance on her as a witness. All in all, he's wowing a sophisticated understanding of how to shape narratives and exploit public sentiments for his benefit. He'd have made a great spin doctor. The ability to be charming while lying fluently and easily with no conscience seems like it'd be a good fit for that job. What do you think about, in your mind, what do you conjure up about the man that they're after or the real man who did these things? Man or men, persons, persons, I don't know. I really have, I can't even begin to understand the mentality. I don't understand the motivation. I don't understand. Let's keep this in mind. At this point of his strategy to avoid responsibility for the murders, he denies everything and cannot even comprehend the mentality involved. This stance will evolve over time until, by the time of his execution, he was willing to confess to 30 murders, blame porn for turning him into the Bundy monster, and admit intrafamilial incest to Dr. Lewis. Do you ever feel like you'd like to escape? <laughs> Let me preface any answer to that remark uh, by giving my feeling about jails. Somebody asked me, uh, that, that question's been asked me before, I mean, would you want to escape? Have you ever planned to escape? And if my attorney was here, he'd say, I object, Your Honor. Uh, uh, Mr. Bundy is being asked a question, an attempt is being made to ask Mr. Bundy to incriminate himself. So, but let me try to get my way out of that one. The Utah State Prison, as you know, is surrounded by several barbed wire fences and, uh, and uh, has many, many guards and towers and the, uh, they've got dogs that run around there and they've got bars in the cells uh, and they've got count procedures. And what do you think that's all for? That's to keep the man in there. Now, does anyone think that if they took those fences down and took those dogs away and those guns away, all those guys would stay? Sure they'd go. The very reason for prison, the very assumption of all those bars and all that barbed wire is that if it's not there, those guys are going to leave. And I swear to God, every man in that prison at one time or another thinks about going, wishes he wasn't there, and wishes he could fly over those fences. I've dreamed about flying over those fences. I've dreamed about climbing over those fences and tunneling under those fences. With every other man in there, I've dreamed about being free because I don't like my liberty to be being taken away, and no man does. Some men in the Utah State Prison become institutionalized because, it, because they've been so brutalized over the years they don't want to think about the outside. But most every man, when he first goes in there, dreams and thinks and, and conjures up all kinds of ideas of freedom. But the real difference, the real measure of a man in prison, as far as escape goes, is the difference between hitting that fence and not hitting that fence between getting shot at and not getting shot at, and having the guts to do it and not having the guts to do it. 
you might be able to open those gates at the Utah State Prison and 80% of the guys wouldn't leave. They'd be afraid to get back out into society. They'd be afraid of being shot or getting another, another beef put on, okay? But some would. All I'm saying is, I'm no fool. I don't like being locked up, and I don't think any man does. Wow. Bundy almost manages to make his escape from Utah State Prison seem like an admirable thing. The real measure of a man who, though innocent, is unbowed by the weight of false allegations and the brutalization of the prison regime, takes his chance at wrongly denied freedom when he sees it. A man who risks bullets, barbed wire, and dogs because he believes in freedom and his right to murder young women and engage in paraphilias with their corpses. It's almost like the Ted Bundy version of the Shawshank Redemption. It'd really be laughable if it wasn't just so perverse and sickening. But it is interesting to see how Bundy has taken the kernel of truth in his answer. Yes, he'd like to escape and turned it into a universal yearning which only a brave few would act on in reality with him being one of those admirable, brave, few. You can see why so many people fell for his bullshit and continue to fall for it anew even today. In summary, Bundy's answer is a carefully constructed narrative that allows him to express a natural human desire for freedom while avoiding any direct implication of intent to escape. It reflects his continuous effort to control the narrative and present himself in a favorable light, even while discussing a potentially incriminating topic. You talked about getting out. Do you ever worry about what some of the parents or some of these women who think you are guilty, that they might come after you? I don't worry about it. Uh, there, there are crazy people anywhere. I've been told that, uh, you know, the parents of these, of these girls are, are, are fairly decent people, I don't know. And I really feel for them because apparently they suffered some an incredible tragedy in their lives. The loss of a loved one is, is probably, probably the most extreme kind of loss you can suffer in, in this life. And I say I, I feel as much for them as anybody can, uh, not having gone through that myself. But as far as worrying about that, hey, if, if, there's, if, if someone's crazy enough and nutty enough to do something like that, I, I can't stop them. There's nothing I can do. You are not guilty. I am not guilty. <laughs> does, that, does that include the time I stole a comic book when I was five years old? <laughs> I am not guilty of the charges which have been filed against me. And the allegations? And the allegations? The rumors and the rumors. <laughs> I don't know all of what you're speaking about, Lucky. It's too broad and I can't get into it in any detail. Uh, but I'm satisfied with, with my blanket statement that I'm innocent. Uh, no man is truly innocent. Uh, I mean, we all have transgressed in some way in our lives. And as I say, I, I've been uh, impolite, and I, there are things I regret having done in my life. Uh, but nothing like the, the things I think that you're referring to. Have you ever physically harmed anyone? Ever physically harmed anyone? No. No. You know, uh, again, not in the context, I think, that you're, you're speaking of. Yeah. So Bundy has regrets and does admit to being impolite and to have stolen a comic book at the age of five. But he's no Bundy monster. Except that, of course, he did commit these murders and he did brutalize the bodies of his victims even after death. But that doesn't serve the tale he is trying to weave. So he starts starts by expressing a theoretical empathy towards the families of the victims, acknowledging the incredible tragedy they faced. This is a strategic move to appear understanding and compassionate, perhaps to humanize himself to the interviewer and audience, by stating he feels as much for them as he can without having experienced their loss. He attempts to position himself as emotionally intelligent and sympathetic. However, he quickly shifts focus to his own safety, stating that he doesn't worry about potential threats. This switch demonstrates his self-focused perspective, and perhaps an underestimation of the depth of anger and grief others might feel towards him. By dismissing the potential threat as something he can't control and attributing it to hypothetical crazy individuals, Bundy is distancing himself from the reality of the anger and seeking to minimize the validity of any such feelings directed towards him. When asked about his guilt, 
Bundy provides a convoluted answer that reiterates his innocence regarding the charges against him while admitting to minor transgressions in life. This serves multiple purposes. It allows him to maintain his claim of innocence regarding the serious allegations he faces, while also presenting himself as a regular person who has made minor mistakes, just like anyone else. By mentioning a childhood incident of stealing a comic book, he trivializes his criminal history and seeks to appear relatable. Admitting a small irrelevant wrong when accused of a far larger, more pressing one is a common tactic when cornered. Finally, when asked if he has ever physically harmed anyone, Bundy's denial is immediate and firm, yet he qualifies it with, not in the context that you're speaking of. This careful phrasing allows him to maintain his stance of innocence in the murders, while not denying that he may have caused harm in less severe or different contexts. In summary, Bundy's response is a calculated attempt to appear empathetic, minimize perceived threats, maintain his claim of innocence, and present himself as a normal individual with minor faults. His careful wording and strategic expression of empathy are indicative of his continued effort to manipulate public perception and control the narrative surrounding him. Again, though, they just don't have the tenor of an innocent person about them. When I've interviewed wrongly accused individuals, there has been far more righteous indignation and anger at the unfairness of it all. It mightn't be helpful, but it is a normal human reaction. For me, Bundy's strategic approach just lacks the ardor of emotion which a real innocent would normally have in this situation. Before I know it, it's two o'clock in the morning. I had to go to bed. And I, I developed that technique in maximum security. Uh, and came, I found that the best way to make time pass is the first way you come up with the schedule which you try to meet. And schedules are made to be broken. But the process of breaking a schedule, you never make it. You know, you always hustle to make that schedule. And you know, time so zips away. You can tie this? No. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, very, very, uh, they wouldn't give me any correction for what's left out of these little papers. In this next section of the video, they're doing shots from behind Bundy in order to get footage of the interviewer asking questions which they can intersperse throughout the interview to give a back and forth effect. Okay, let me ask sense. just a question here now, okay? Just a couple of questions I've already asked you. You don't have to answer them, go. You'll have to admit that there is at least a lot of circumstantial evidence. Do you ever feel like you're going insane? What's more? I, I, I didn't ask that, anyway. What's um, more? <laughs> speaking about getting out of prison, do you worry about what some of the parents of some of these girls you've been accused of kidnapping or killing might do to you? Do you ever think about the possibility of facing a firing squad? I am involved. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've already qualified for the third degree. Oh, come on, guys. Yeah, I know more about the... My class is graduating in about a month. In law school? Uh, I'll, I'll bet you I know more about law than you any of them. What's the law school with who's graduating? That pisses me off. <laughs> now, that does piss me off. Goodbye. Thanks, you. Tab, take care. We'll be later. So, what have we learned about Bundy from this interview? He's strategic, calculated, charming, manipulative, narcissistic, and a very practiced and capable liar. He continually, explicitly presents himself as just like everybody else, but likes parsing his words and equivocations just enough to give himself wiggle room should he be caught out. His charm has clearly gotten him out of many difficult spots in the past, and he, like any inveterate gambler, is going to back himself again when it comes to the upcoming trial. Without doubt, the expression on that Garfield County Sheriff in the background is my new favorite clip, though. He is just as sick of Bundy's bullshit as I am, after having to sit through another interview full of lies. 
Speaking of interviews full of lies, do let me know in the comments if you're interested in me continuing to analyze Bundy interviews. I'm toying with the idea of analyzing each of his interviews and finishing up with a lengthy two to three hours long video about Ted Bundy, drawing together his entire history, what he said in all of these interviews, and what we know from researchers into his case and various psychiatric assessments into what should be a comprehensive accounting of events. Let me know if that's something you're interested in. If you found this video interesting and informative, please do consider liking, commenting and subscribing as well as mentioning us to others who might find it interesting. On screen now you should see links to two videos which I think you may enjoy. Feel free to click on one of them or check out the channel page to browse all my previous videos to find one that interests you. With that said, thanks for watching and take care of yourselves and each other.